Introduction of Anthology of Magazine First for 1913 Edited by William Stanley Braithwaite This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1913 Edited by William Stanley Braithwaite Introduction Poetry is one of the realities that persist. The facade and dome of palace and temple, the monuments of heroes and saints, crumble before the ruining breath of time, while the psalms last. So when another year passes and we sum up our achievements, there is no achievement more vital in registering the soul of a people than its poetry. But in all things that men do, their relationship is objective, except those things in which art, religion, love, and nature express their influence through the private thoughts and feelings of men. These four things are the realities. All the others are symbols. And the essence of art, as well as religion and love and nature, is a conscious and mysterious thing called poetry. And men will find, if they will only stop to look, that at the bottom of all this poetry, no matter what the theme or the particular artistic shaping, there is something with which they are familiar because in their own souls there has been an unceasing mystery which they find named in the magic utterance of some lonely and neglected maker of verses the poetry in the magazines for this past year has been of a general high standard the long poems have been well sustained and there has been a larger quantity of pure lyric pieces than in the past two or three years the influence of macefield has shown itself in american verse notably in the two long poems by harry kemp the harvest hand and the factory one of the noblest poems of the year is henry van dyke's daybreak in the grand canyon of arizona which breathes a fine national spirit full of reverence for the greatness with which the american destiny is symbolized in the natural grandeur of our country mr markham has a long narrative in the shoes of happiness full of his visionary and spiritual promptings and in the vision of gettysburg mr robert underwood johnson reflects also the national spirit with particular significance the poetry of the year in volumes has not been as ample as last year the three poets who have aroused most discussion are the bengali poet tagore who brought to the western world in gitanjali a spiritual message full of mystic but exalted idealism francis thompson the great catholic poet because of the publication of his collected works and robert bridges who by his appointment to the english laureateship became known to a large number of readers who had hitherto been unfamiliar with his very perfect and delicate gift of lyric beauty of american poets the volumes of fanny stearns davis william rose benet josephine preston peabody margaret root garvin and george edward woodbury are the most significant the most important book of poems of the year by an american poet however is that of nicholas vachel lindsay general william booth enters into heaven and other poems here is a man with a big vision with a fine originality and an art that is particularly his own there has been no lyric year this autumn but a little volume that serves in some sense its purpose is miss jessie b rittenhouse's little book of modern verse which is intended to represent the quality of contemporary american verse i want to call attention to a poet who has not yet presented himself except through an occasional magazine piece but who has written two of the finest sonnets in american poetry last year i reprinted in my annual summary mr mellon leonard's fishers as an old mercer and pronounced that an achievement which could hardly be surpassed but in the sonnet november which is reprinted in this book mr fisher has done i believe something that is even greater it must rank with lizette woodworth reese's tears and longfellow's nature as the best sonnets that have been accomplished by american poets i have known one competent judge and lover of poetry to declare that not since keats on first looking into chapman's homer and miss reese's tears has there appeared so fine a sonnet in english poetry the man who has written november has added something to american poetry that cannot be too highly estimated 
Another poet who has enriched the magazines this year, after a period of silence, is Mr. Edwin Arlington Robinson, and in The Field of Glory, we are under the spell once more of that characteristic magic with which he is endowed alone among American poets. As in former years, in my annual summary in the Boston Transcript, I have examined the contents of the leading American monthly magazines. I originally started nine years ago, when the first summary appeared with these six, The Atlantic, Harper's, Scribner's, Century, Lippincott's, and McClure's. Later, I turned to the Forum. The poetry in McClure's during the two years previous to the beginning of the present year had fallen off. The magazine would reprint occasionally verses from the books of accomplished but little-known English and Irish poets, which, with the small amount of space that it devoted to verse, left but little chance of encouragement to native singers. This year I have included the smart set, which, under the new editorship of Mr. Willard Huntington Wright, himself a poet of considerable attainment, has been the means of offering the public a high and consistent standard of excellence in the verse it printed. To the six magazines, namely Harper's, Scribner's, Century, Forum, Lippincott's, and the Smart Set, I have added this year a weekly, The Bellman. West of New York, it is the best edited and most influential periodical published. Indeed, it is widely read in the East. In its pages, three of the younger American poets of distinctive achievements have been presented. Though the late Arthur Upsom had published some two or three books of verse before The Bellman was established, yet it was practically the first American magazine to print his work. Amelia J. Burr made her first considerable poetic appearance in The Bellman, and the best work, the sonnets that have placed Mr. Mellon Leonard Fisher in the forefront of contemporary American or English sonnet writers, appeared in this same publication. As last year, I have winnowed from other magazines distinctive poems for classification and notice, one each from The Outlook, The Independent, The North American Review, Poetry, A Magazine of Verse, three from The Poetry Journal, and three from The Yale Review. The poems published during the year in the seven representative magazines I have submitted to an impartial critical test, choosing from the total number what I consider the distinctive poems of the year. From the distinctive pieces are selected 81 poems, to which are added five from the other magazines not represented in the list of seven, making a total of 86, which are intended to represent what I call an anthology of magazine verse for 1913. By a further process of elimination, similar to that of previous years, I have made another selection of 40 poems, which for one reason or another, in the purpose of this estimate, seem to stand grouped above the others. The medium of magazine publication, towards which some critics and some poets, too, a fact which can hardly be justified, and a considerable portion of the reading public, have a disparaging opinion, is deserving of better repute for the general high quality of poetic art that is published. Not many years ago, it was a favorite exercise of the reviewer, when noticing the average book of verse which happened to include selections reprinted from various magazines, to term the work magazinable, or the poet a magazine poet. Even poets who detested being called minor poets preferred that rather vague and indiscriminate distinction rather than the unrespectable magazinable. Quoting what I have written in previous years, to emphasize the methods which guided my selections, the reader will see how impartial are the tests by which the distinctive and best poems are chosen. I have not allowed any special sympathy with the subject to influence my choice. I have taken the poet's point of view and accepted his value of the theme he dealt with. The question was, how vital and compelling did he make it? The first test was the sense of pleasure the poem communicated then to discover the secret or meaning of the pleasure felt, and in doing so to realize how much richer one became in a knowledge of the purpose of life by reason of the poem's message. In 121 numbers of these seven magazines, I find there were published during 1913 a total of 506 poems, the total number of poems printed in each magazine, and the number of the distinctive poems are Century, total 58. 30 of distinction. Harper's total 57, 29 of distinction. 
Scribner's total 45, 30 of distinction. Forum total 53, 27 of distinction. Lippincott's total 66, 21 of distinction. The Bellman, total 53, 25 of distinction. The Smart Set, total 169, 49 of distinction. Following the text of the poems making the anthology in this volume, I have given the titles and authors of all the poems classified as the distinctive published in the magazines for the year, only one excepting those that are included in the anthology. In addition, I give a list of all the poems and their authors in the 121 numbers of the magazines examined, for the purpose of a record which readers and students of poetry will find useful. I wish to acknowledge my indebtedness and thanks to the editors of Scribner's Magazine, Harper's Magazine, The Forum, The Century Magazine, The Outlook, Lippincott's Magazine, The Bellman, The Independent, The Smart Set, The Yale Review, Poetry Magazine of Verse, and to the publishers of these magazines, including the Poetry Journal, for the permission kindly given to reprint in this volume the text of the poems making the Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1913. To the authors of these poems, I am equally indebted and grateful for their willingness to have me reprint their work in this form. Since their appearance in the magazines and before the close of the year, when the contents of this volume was made up, two poems herein included appeared in the original volumes of their authors. For the use of William Rose Benet's The Marvelous Munchausen, I have also to thank the Century Company, Publishers of Merchants of Cathay, in which volume it appears. As far as I know, only three of the poems here included are to come out immediately in books by their authors. The last four stanzas of a threnody by Mr. Louis V. Ledoux are reprinted by permission of the editor of Scribner's Magazine, and the rest of the poem is published in advance by permission of Messrs. G. P. Putnam's Sons from a volume of Mr. Ledoux's poems, which are also to include the hymn to Demeter from a Sicilian idol. They are to issue in January under the title of The Shadow of Etna. The two selections by Mr. Richard Burton, Here Lies Pierrot, and Human, the two by Willard Huntington Wright, What of the Night, and Later, the one by George Edward Woodbury, St. John and the Fawn, and the two by Richard Le Gallienne, May is Building Her House, and Desiderium, which, while this introduction is being written, has come out in Mr. Le Gallienne's volume, the Lonely Dancer, and other poems, John Lane Company, are also being issued immediately in forthcoming volumes. If there are any others, I do not know of them, and in which case I would gladly give credit, so I trust any omission of such will be charged to ignorance rather than intention. I wish it to be understood that the privilege extended me so courteously by both the authors and the magazines to print the poems in this volume does not in any sense restrict the authors in their rights to print the poems in volumes of their own. A significant fact which the poetry in this volume must bring to the reader's mind in considering American poetry of today is that these selections have been published for the first time during the current year. Our poetry needs, more than anything else, encouragement and support to reveal its qualities. The poets are doing satisfying and vitally excellent work and it only remains for the American public to do its duty by showing a substantial appreciation. Lastly, I wish to thank the Boston Transcript for the privilege of reprinting material in this book, which originally appeared in the columns of that paper. Cambridge, December 1913 End of Introduction Hymn to Demeter by Louis V. Ledoux Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone From A Sicilian Idyll Weave the dance and raise again the sacred chorus, Wreathe the garlands of the spring about the hair. Now once more the meadows burst in bloom before us, Crying swallows dart and glitter through the air. Glints the ploughshare in the brown and fragrant furrow, Pigeons coo in shady coverts as they pair. Come the furtive mountain folk from cave and burrow, Lean and blinking in the sunlight's sudden glare. 
bright through midmost heaven moves the lesser lion hide the hyads in the ocean caverns hoar past the shoulders of the sunset flames orion following the sisters seaward evermore gleams the east at evening lit by low acturus out to subtle scented dawns beside the shore yet a little and the pleiades will lure us weave the dance and raise the chorus as of yore far to eastward up the fabled gulf of isis northward southward westward now the trader goes passing headlands clustered yellow with narcissus bright with hyacinth with poppy and with rose shines the sea and falls the billow as undaunted past the rising of the stars that no man knows sails he onward through the island's siren haunted till the clashing gates of rock before him close kindly mother of the beasts and birds and flowers gracious bringer of the barley and the grain earth awakened feels thy sunlight and thy showers great demeter let us call thee not in vain lead us safely from the seed time to the threshing past the harvest and the vineyard's purple stain let us see thy corn pale hair the sunlight meshing when the sounding flails of autumn swing again yale review end of poem this recording is in the public domain Over the Winter Threshold by Bliss Carmen, read for LibriVox.org by Roma Singh. Over the wintry threshold, who comes with joy today, so frail yet so enduring, to triumph or dismay? Ah, quicker tears are springing, and quickly they are dried. For sorrow walks before her, but gladness walks beside. She comes with gusts of laughter, and music as of rills, with tenderness and sweetness. The wisdom of the hills her hands are strong to comfort her heart is quick to heed she knows the signs of sadness she knows the voice of need there is no living creature however poor or small but she will know its trouble and hearken to its call oh well they fare forever by mighty dreams possessed whose hearts have lain a moment on that eternal breast and a poem this recording is in the public domain In April by Margaret Lee Ashley, read for LibriVox.org by Roma Singh. If I am slow of forgetting, it is because the sun has such old tricks of setting when April days are done. The soft spring sunlight traces old patterns, green and gold. The flowers have no new faces; the very buds are old. If I am slow of forgetting, ah well, come back and see the same old sunbeams petting my garden plots and me come smell the green things growing the boxwood after rain see where old beds are showing their slender spears again at dusk that fosters dreaming come back at dusk and rest and watch our old star gleaming against the primrose west end of poem this recording is in the public domain may is building her house by richard lagalien Read for LibriVox.org by G. Carlson. May is building her house. May is building her house with apple blooms. She is roofing over the glimmering rooms. Of the oak and the beech hath she builded its beams, and spinning all day at her secret looms, with aras of leaves each wind swayed wall, she pictureth over and peopleth it all. With echoes and dreams, and singing of streams. May is building her house, of petal and blade, of the roots of the oak is the flooring made. With a carpet of mosses and lichen and clover, each small miracle over and over, and tender traveling green things strayed. Her windows, the morning and evening star, and her rustling doorways ever ajar. With the coming and going of fair things blowing, the thresholds of the four winds are. May is building her house from the dust of things, 
She is making the songs and the flowers and the wings. From October's tossed and trodden gold, she is making the young year out of the old. Yea, out of winter's flying sleet, she is making all the summer sweet. And the brown leaves spurned of November's feet, she is changing back again to springs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In a Forgotten Burying Ground by Ruth Guthrie Harding Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gantz Eternal in the brooding of the old Norwegian spruces I hear the wistful tenderness of loves they used to know And in the swelling wood notes that the eager springtide looses Sobs again their heartbreak from the springs of long ago and sometime through the silence with the April shadows lying aslant the solemn acre where I take my dreamless rest, perhaps the stifled need of you my heart was ever crying will find its way across the years to stir a stranger's breast. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wind by Fanny Stearns Davis. The wind bows down the poplar trees, the wind bows down the crested seas, and he has bowed the heart of me under his hand of memory. O oh, heavy handed wind who goes, hurting the petals of the rose, who leaves the grasses on the hill, broken and pallid, spent and still. O oh, heavy-handed wind who brings to me all echoing ancient things, echoing sorrow and defeat, crying like mourners hard to meet. The wind bows down the poplar trees and all the ocean's argosies, but deeper bends the heart of me under his hand of memory. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Speckled Trout by Madison Cowain Read for LibriVox.org by Paul Harvey With rod and line I took my way That led me through the gossip trees Where all the forest was a sway With hurry of the running breeze. I took my hat off to a flower that nodded welcome as I passed, and pelted by a morning shower, unto its heart a bee held fast. A head of gold one great weed tossed, and leaned to look when I went by, and where the brook the roadway crossed, the daisy kept on me its eye. And when I stooped to bathe my face, and seat me at a great tree's foot, I heard the stream say, Mark the place, and undermine it rock and root. And o'er the whirling water there a dragonfly its shuttle plied, where wild the fern let down its hair and leaned to see the water's pride. A speckled trout, the spotted elf, whom I had come so far to see, stretched out above a rocky shelf a shadow sleeping mockingly. And I have sat here half the day, regarding it it has not stirred. I heard the running water say, he does not know the magic word, the word that changes everything and brings all nature to his hand, that makes of this great trout a king and opes the way to fairyland. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Trees by Joyce Kilmer Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson I think that I shall never see A poem lovely as a tree A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed Against the sweet earth's hungry breast A tree that looks at God all day And lifts her leafy arms to pray a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, 
upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Poetry, a magazine of verse. In the poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Hospital by Arthur Geterman. Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. Because on the branch that is tapping my pain, a sun wakened leaf bud uncurled is bursting its rusty brown sheathing in twain, I know there is spring in the world. Because through the sky patch whose azure and white my window frames all the day long, a yellow bird dips for an instant of flight, I know there is song. Because even here, in this mansion of woe, where creep the dull hours leaden shod, compassion and tenderness aid me, I know there is God. Scribner's Arthur Geterman End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love of Life by Tertius Van Dyke Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens Love you not the tall trees, spreading wide their branches, Cooling with their green shade the sunny days of June? Love you not the little bird lost among the leaflets, Dreamingly repeating a quaint brief tune? Is there not a joy in the waste windy places? Is there not a song by the long dusty way? Is there not a glory in the sudden hour of struggle? Is there not a peace in the long quiet day? Love you not the meadows with the deep lush grasses? Love you not the cloud flocks noiseless in their flight? Love you not the cool wind that stirs to meet the sunrise? Love you not the stillness of the warm summer night? Have you never wept with a grief that slowly passes? Have you never laughed when a joy goes running by? Know you not the peace of rest that follows labour? You have not learnt to live, then how can you dare to die? Scribner's Tertius Van Dyke End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. God's Will by Mildred Howells Read for LibriVox.org God meant me to be hungry, so I should seek to find wisdom and truth and beauty to satisfy my mind. God meant me to be lonely, lest I should wish to stay in some green earthly Eden, too long from heaven away. God meant me to be weary, that I should yearn to rest this feeble, aching body deep in the earth's dark breast. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Birth of a Child by Lewis Untermeyer Read for LibriVox.org by Kathleen Bond Lo, to the battleground of life, child, you have come Like a conquering shout out of a struggle Into strife, out of a darkness, into doubt Girt with the fragile armor of youth, child, you must ride into endless wars with the sword of protest, the buckler of truth, and a banner of love to sweep the stars. About you the world's despair will surge. Into defeat you must plunge and grope. Be to the faltering an urge. Be to the hopeless years a hope. Be to the darkened world a flame be to its unconcern a blow, for out of its pain and tumult you came, 
and into its tumult and pain you go. End of recording. This poem is in the public domain. To a Child Falling Asleep by Robert Alden Sanborn Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel May Over the dim edge of sleep I lean, and in her eyes' illimitable grey distances look down into the shadow-tinted space, the cloudy air of sleep, to see the rose-lit petal of a child's fair soul seek dreamily the farther gloom where waking eyes may follow her no more. One more last time her lids are lifted, and in her look I read a wistful fare thee well. Her spirit waves a twinkling white hand, her bark is out upon the sea of dream, the calm, grey sea, full and immovably established, that drinks the river of my love without o'erflowing, nor ever gives my image back to me. When o'er the sun-swept land, murmuring twilight spread her dusky tent, a stranger passed before our friendly sun, between the dark and dawn, a stranger whom we love but never see, and as she came and cast her blue benignant shadow over all, she set a silver trumpet to her lips, and blew a note that thrilled in children's hearts, because in little hearts the echo fairies love to play, roaming the scented meadows there, where love has been and sown the amaranthine flowers, out of whose pristine cups are born the singing stars. And as the first free rainbow bubble sailed, launched by the stranger with the silver pipe, upon the listening air, as first the hollow note kissed the sweet lips and died of happiness, the little child unfurled her sails. I stood there on the very verge of sleep and called to her, and love's own self had deigned to wait within my heart, because I kept it always fit for childish guests, and would have given welcome had she stayed. But then I saw the eyelids close, and knew that Asriel, who championed her soul, had shut the gates lest I should see more than my life could bear. Yet I had seen her go, and sight no more could hold of beauty's wine. I had seen the fair face flush, as the soft curtains of the tinted west are drawn before the temple of the night, when the day-worn sun has passed within, had seen the little body, whitely gowned, folded within its nest, had caught the last light kiss, before the lips lay still, and I had looked into the cool grey deep where sleep received the rose-leaf soul of her and bore it out upon her gentle waters. Into the night I passed, where on the mellow bosom of the west floated the flame-lit shell of Hesperus, and as I stayed with hallowed breath, the soul of fire fell over the rim of night, and then I knew the soul of her I loved had heard the last clear call, the low Elysian chant of Hesperus, and loving me had borne the love I gave out and beyond and over all the ends of earth, and where the altar flame of Venus burned had laid the gift and breathed her childhood's prayer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Roman Doll by Agnes Lee Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson in a museum how an image of paint and wood leaped to her life with a love's control struck the chords of her motherhood passionate little mother soul fair to her sight were the stolid eyes dear to her toil the robes impearled she crooned it the ancient lullabies she gathered it close from the outer world they watched together as nero's pyres fed the haze of a hundred fires. Me in her fresh young arms she bore, see, I am small, only a doll, but I keep her kiss forevermore. Long and lonely the toy has lain, one by one into time's abyss years have dropped as the drops of rain, yet the cycles have left us this. O red-lived mother, O mother sweet, Today a sister has heard you call. Your heart is beating in her heartbeat. I saw her weep o'er the crumbling doll. She knew. She knew. You had lived and smiled. You had loved your dream, little Roman child. Me in her fresh young arms she bore. See, I am small, only a doll. But I keep her kiss forevermore. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Sappho by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Midnight, and in the darkness not a sound, So with hushed breathing sleeps the autumn night, Only the white immortal stars shall know, Here in the house by the low lintel door, How for the last time I have lit the lamp, I think you are not wholly careless now, Walls that have sheltered me so many an hour, Bed that has brought me ecstasy and sleep, Floors that have borne me when a gale of joy Lifted my soul and made me half a god. Farewell across the threshold many feet Shall pass but never Sappho's feet again. Girls shall come in whom love has made aware, of all their swaying beauty they shall sing, But never Sappho's voice like golden fire Shall seek for heaven through your echoing rafters. There shall be sparrows bringing back the spring Over the long blue meadows of the sea, And south wind playing on the reeds of rain, But never Sappho's whisper in the night, Never her love cry when the lover comes, farewell i close the door and make it fast the little street lies meek beneath the moon running as rivers run to meet the sea i too go seaward and shall not return o oh, garlands on the doorposts that i pass woven of asters and of autumn leaves i make a prayer for you cypris be kind that every lover may be given love I shall not hasten lest the paving stones Should echo with my sandals and awake Those who are warm beneath the cloak of sleep, Lest they should rise and see me and should say, Whither goes Sappho lonely in the night? Whither goes Sappho, whither all men go? For they go driven, straining back with fear, And Sappho goes as lightly as a leaf, Blown from brown autumn forests to the sea. Here on the rocks, use lifted from the waves, I shall await the waking of the dawn. Lying beneath the weight of dark as one, Lies breathless till the lover shall awake. And with the sun the sea shall cover me, I shall be less than the dissolving foam. Murmuring and melting on the ebbing tide, I shall be less than spendthrift, less than shells and yet I shall be greater than the gods. For destiny no more can bow my soul, as rain bows down the watchfires on the hills. Yea, if my soul escape, it shall aspire toward the white heaven as flame that has its will. I go not bitterly, nor dumb with grief, not broken by the ache of love I go, as one grown tired lies down and hopes to sleep. Yet they shall say it was for Circulus, She died because she could not bear her love. They shall remember how we used to walk, Here on the cliff beneath the oleanders, In the long limpid twilight of the spring, Looking towards Chios where the amber sky Was pierced by the faint arrow of a star. How should they know the wind of a new beauty? Sweeping my soul had winnowed it with song. I have been glad, though love should come or go, Happy as trees that find a wind to sway them, Happy again when it has left them rest. Others shall say, Grave Dika wrought her death. She would not lift her lips to take a kiss, Or ever lift her eyes to take a smile. She was a pool the winter paths with ice, That the wild hunter in the hills must leave, with thirst unslaked in the brief southward sun. Ah, Dika, it is not for thee I go, and not for Phaon, though his ship lifts sail, here in the windless harbour for the south. O oh, darkling deities that guard the Nile, watch over one whose god is far away. Egypt be kind to him, his eyes are deep, yet they are wrong who say it was for him. 
how should they know that sappho lived and died faithful to love not faithful to the lover never transfused and lost in what she loved never so wholly loving nor at peace i asked for something greater than i found and every time that love has made me weep i have rejoiced that love could be so strong for i have stood apart and watched my soul caught in the gust of passion as a bird with baffled wings against the dusty whirlwind struggles and frees itself to find the sky it is not for a single god i go i have grown weary of the winds of heaven i will not be a reed to hold the sound of whatsoever breath the gods may blow turning my torment into music for them they gave me life the gift was bountiful i lived with the swift singing strength of fire seeking for beauty as a flame for fuel beauty in all things and in every hour the gods have given life i gave them song the debt is paid and now i turn to go the breath of dawn blows the stars out like lamps there is a rim of silver on the sea as one grown tired who hopes to sleep i go scribner's end of poem this recording is in the public domain of moira up the glen by edward j o'brien read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone it's little that i'd care for the glories of ireland waiting for the shadows to gather in the glen come the time of darkness sitting by the hearthlight whispering with bated breath for fear the little men should catch us and spell us to serve them for a year's time toiling and moiling within a fairy snare i'm thinking to be fearsome in the grey misty strangeness tis hiding we'll be in the clear free air the sunlight above us and willow hedge for shelter a tangle of soft things to rustle by the stream where moira my white dove whose beauty is my sorrow would sit with me and travel on the long bright dream travel with the water from the mountain to the meadow down across the lowlands and gaily to the sea out beyond the breakers to the shimmer of a far line poised and trembling within the heart of me what shall i murmur to coax the dream of beauty out from the shadows to welcome in the dawn how shall i sing it that she may know the glory know it and come by the first flush of morn the moonlight is dark light tis fear i'm after feeling the fairies should be in it and steal her heart away a goblet for their feasting they drain it and fill it with dreams of a far world beyond the light of day it's god's light i'm wanting and moira to see it see it and tremble with the love of god and seeing it she'd turn and look within my own eyes and wonder at the vision transforming a sod into worshipful silence and thought that is living burning and shaped by the warmth of its fire to a chalice of tears and of laughter for singing the lovely unfolding of dream purged desire smart set end of poem this recording is in the public domain morning glories by john g nyhart read for LibriVox.org by aaron grassy distant as a dream's flight lay an eerie plain where the weary moonlight swooned into a moan wailing after dead seed came the ghost of rain there was i a wild weed growing all alone like a doubted story came the thought of day god in all his glory lingered otherwhere busy with the spring thrill many dreams away could a little weed's will fling so far a prayer lo the sudden wonder is a prayer so fleet from the desert under, morning glories grew, twined me, bound me with caressing feet, 
wove song round me pink, white, blue. As a fog is rifted by the eager breeze, darkness broke and lifted, tossing like a sea. Lo, the dawn was flowering through the maple trees. Oh, and you were showering kisses over me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lest I Learn by Witter Binner Read for LibriVox.org Lest I learn with clearer sight Such beauty cannot be Tie a bandage, pull it tight Blind me, I would not see Lest I learn with clearer will such wonder cannot be. Oh, kiss me nearer, nearer still, and make a fool of me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Later by Willard Huntington Wright. Read for LibriVox by Stephen J. Battaglia. I went to the place where my youth took birth in the slow round kiss of an amorous girl, when sonnets and lace were the measure of earth, when death was forgotten and life was a whirl. I addled my brain with the memories flown of Heatherby Kaiser and Muriel Moore. I thought of the women and men I had known, the glittering eyes and the bolt on the door, the warm gray walls and the odor of musk, the wine, the piano, the glistening feet, the eyes grown hazy like shadows at dusk, the minstreling music that rose from the street. I thought of Elise with her soft gold hair and the button hook hung from the chandelier. The spirit of passionate youth had been there, but somehow the dream of it wasn't quite clear, for the place had been altered. The walls were red, and the woodwork was stained with a desolate brown. And they told me a woman had lain in the bed for a year and a half with the curtains down. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Old Maid by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens I saw her in a Broadway car The woman I might grow to be I felt my lover look at her And then turn suddenly to me Her hair was dull and drew no light And yet its colour was as mine Her eyes were strangely like my eyes Though love had never made them shine her body was a thing grown thin, hungry for love that never came. Her soul was frozen in the dark, unwarmed forever by love's flame. I felt my lover look at her, and then turn suddenly to me. His eyes were magic to defy the woman I shall never be. The Forum, Sarah Teasdale End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Departure by John Hall Wheelock Read for LibriVox.org by Rowan Pattergill The twilight is starred, the dawn has arisen, Light breaks from the east and song from her prison. Faint odours and sounds the west wind discloses, of laughter and birds, of singing and roses. It is time to be gone, day scatters the gloom, but here at my side, but still in the room, like the angel of life, too kind to depart, you hang at my lips, you hang at my heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Adieu by Florence Earl Coates 
Read for LibriVox.org by Rowan Pattergill. Sorrow, quit me for a while. Wintry days are over. Hope again with April smile. Violets sows and clover. Pleasure follows in her path. Love itself flies after. And the brook a music hath. Sweet as childhood's laughter. Not a bird upon the bough can repress its rapture. Not a bud that blossoms now, but doth beauty capture. Sorrow, thou art winter's mate. Spring cannot regret thee. Yet, ah yet, my friend of late, I shall not forget thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hearts Tied by Ethel M. Hewitt Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens I thought I had forgotten you, so far apart our lives were thrust, t'was only as the earth forgets the seed the sower left in trust. T'was only as the creeks forget the tides that left their hollows dry, or as the homebound ship forgets streamers of seaweed drifting by. My heart is earth that keeps untold The secret of the seeds that sleep. My thoughts are chalices of sand, Your memory floods them, and I weep. Harper's Ethel M. Hewitt End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Waiting by Charles Hanson Tone Read for LibriVox.org by Kayla Jones. I thought my heart would break because the spring was slow. I said, How long young April sleeps beneath the snow? But when at last she came and buds broke into dew, I dreamed of my lost love and my heart broke too. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Desiderium by Richard Leigh Gallien Read for LibriVox.org by Kayla Jones Face in a tomb that lies so still May I draw near and watch you sleep and love you Without word or tear You smile, your eyelids flicker Shall I tell how the world goes that lost you? Shall I tell? Ah, love, lift not your eyelids Tis the same old story that we laughed at still the same. We knew it, you and I. We knew it all. Still is the small the great, the great the small. Still the cold lie quenches the flaming truth, and still in battle age wars against youth. Yet I believe, still in the ever-living God that fills your grave with perfume, writing your name in violets across the sod, shielding your holy face from hail and snow, and Though the withered stay, the lovely go. No transitory wrong or wrath of things shatters the faith that each slow minute brings the meadow near to us where your feet shall flutter near me like white butterflies. That meadow where immortal lovers meet, gazing forever in immortal eyes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Human by Richard Burton Read for LibriVox.org by Kayla Jones Weighed down by grief, o'erborne by deep despair, she lifted up white arms to heaven and prayed that day for death. She made a mighty prayer beside her dear one gently to be laid. In standing dust, it flashed across her mind how she must make a seemly silhouette against the sky, her figure sharply lined upon the western sunlight black as jet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ghost by Herman Hagedorn Read for LibriVox by Stephen J. Battaglia One whom I loved and never can forget returned to me in dream and spoke with me as audibly as sweet familiarly as though warm fingers twined warm fingers yet. 
Her eyes were bright, and with great wonder, wet as in old days, when some strange, swift decree brought touch close love or death. And sorrow-free she spoke as one long purged of all regret. I heard, oh, glad beyond all speech I heard, till to my lips the flaming query flashed. How is it? Over there? Then, quite undone, she trembled. In her deep eyes, like a bird, the gladness fluttered, and as one abashed, she shook her head bewildered, and was gone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Mountain Gateway by Bliss Carmen Read for LibriVox by Stephen J. Battaglia I know a vale where I would go one day, when June comes back, and all the world once more is glad with summer. Deep with shade it lies, a mighty cleft in the green, bosoming hills, a cool, dim gateway to the mountain's heart. On either side the wooded slopes come down, hemlock and beech and chestnut, here and there through the deep forest laurel spreads and gleams, pink-white as Daphne in her loveliness, that still perfection from the world withdrawn, as if the wood gods had arrested their immortal beauty in her breathless flight. Far overhead, against the arching blue, gray ledges overhang from dizzy heights, scarred by a thousand winters and untamed. The road winds in from the broad river lands, luring the happy traveler turn by turn up to the lofty mountains of the sky. And where the road runs in the valley's foot, through the dark woods the mountain stream comes down, singing and dancing all its youth away among the boulders and the shallow runs. Where sunbeams pierce and mossy tree trunks hang, drenched all day long with murmuring sound, and spray. There, light of heart and foot free, I would go up to my home among the lasting hills, and in my cabin doorway sit me down, companioned in that leafy solitude by the wood ghosts of twilight and of peace. And in that sweet seclusion I should hear among the cool-leafed beeches in the dusk the calm-voiced thrushes at their evening hymn, so undistraught so rapturous, so pure. It well might be, in wisdom and in joy, the seraphs singing at the birth of time the unworn ritual of eternal things. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Perugia by Amelia Josephine Barr Read for LibriVox.org by Kathleen Bond For the sake of a weathered gray city set high on a hill to the northward I go, where Umbria's valley lies mile upon emerald mile, outspread like a chart. The wind in her steep narrow streets is eternally chill from the neighboring snow, but linger who will in the lure of a southerly smile, here is my heart. Wrought to a mutual blueness are mountains and sky, intermingling they meet. Little gray breathings of olive arise from the plain like sighs that are seen. For man and his maker harmonious toil, and the sigh of such labor is sweet. And the fruits of their patience are vistas of vineyards and grain in a glory of green. No wind from the valley that passes the casement but flings invisible flowers. The carol of birds is a gossamer tissue of gold on a background of bells. Sweetest of all, in the silence the nightingale sings through the silver-pure hours till the stars disappear like a dream that may never be told, which the dawning dispels. Never so darkling the alley but opens at last an unlimited space. Each gate is the frame of a vision that stretches away to the rims of the sky. Never a scar that was left by the pitiless past but has taken a grace, 
like the mark of a smile that was turned upon children at play in a summer gone by. Many the tyrants, my city, who held thee in thrall, what remains of them now? Names whispered back from the dark through a portal ajar, they come not again. By men thou wert made and wert marred, but outlasting them all is the soul that is thou. A soul that shall speak to my soul till I too pass afar. And perchance even then. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ghosts by Marguerite Moores Marshall Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee They call you cold New England, but underneath your snow is blood as red as roses that in your gardens blow. The God that lights your forests with porch of cardinal flower forbids that ever the Puritan escape his crimson hour. The flame that skims brown furrows, the scarlet tanager's breast, is signed to preacher and plowman of dreams that haunt their rest. When witch and warlock perished by faggot scaffold and tree, their tortures slew their bodies, but set their spirits free. In freedom gliding, gloating, through the haunts their children claim, the swollen ghosts of the wicked grow fat on new-wrought shame. The old sweet evil lingers, the demon of uncontrol, and madness creeps and crouches in every haggard soul. And he who held moon revels in Salem forests deep well loves his hypocrite servants, nor seeks to spoil their sleep. They call you cold, New England, but surely even your snow is drift not of ice but of ashes to guard the flames below. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. St. John and the Fawn by George Edward Woodbury. Read Philipvox.org by Rachel May. O oh, blessed imagination, bright power beneath man's lid that in apparent beauty unveils the beauty hid. In the gleaming of the instant abides the immortal thing, our souls that voyage unspeaking press forward, wing and wing. From every passing object a brighter radiance pours, the leith of our daily lives sweeps by eternal shores. On the deep below Amalfi, where the long roll of the wave slowly breathed and slipped beneath me to grey cliff and sounding cave, came a boatload of dark fishers. Past, and on the bright sea shone, there, the vision of a moment, I beheld the young Saint John. At the stern the boy stood bending, full his dreaming gaze on me. Inexorably spread between us flashed the blue strait of the sea, slowly receding, Distant, distant, while my bosom scarce drew breath, dreaming eyes on my eyes dreaming, holy beauty without death. In the cloudland, O Amalfi, where with mists the deep ravine, like a cauldron smoked, and, clearing, showed far down the pictured scene, capes and bays and peaks and ocean, and the city like a gem, set in circlets of pale azure that her beauty ring and hem. Once, returning from the chasm by the mountain's woodland way, underneath the oak and chestnut where I loved to make delay, and dark boys and girls with faggots would pass near on that wild lawn, and at times they brought me rosebuds. There, one day, I saw a fawn. The wood was still with noontide, the very trees seemed lone, when from a neighbouring thicket his moon eyes on me shone. Motionless and bright and staring, and with a startled grace as nature wildly magical was the beauty of his face. And as some gentle creature that, curious, has fear, 
dumb, he stood and gazed upon me, but did not venture near. And I moved not, nor motioned, nor gave him any sign, nor broke the momentary spell of the old world divine. Love, with no other agent save communion by the eye, evoked from those bright creatures our secret unity. There, flowering from the old ages, hung on time's blossoming stem all that fairest was in me or loveliest in them. And truly it was happiness unto a poet's heart to find that living in his breast, which is immortal art. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. School by Percy McKay, read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. One, old Hezekiah leaned hard on his hoe and squinted long at Eben, his lank son. The silence shrilled with crickets, day was done, and row on dusky row, tall bean poles ribbed with dark, the gold bright afterglow. Eben stood staring, ever one by one, the tendril tops turned ashen as they flared. Still Eben stared. Oh, there is wonder on New Hampshire hills, hoeing the warm, bright furrows of brown earth, and there is grandeur in the stone wall's birth, and in the sweat that spills. From rugged toil its sweetness, yet for wild young wills there is no dew of wonder but stark dearth in one old man who hoes his long bean rose and only hoes. Old Hezekiah turned slow on his heel, he touched his son, through all the carking day there are so many littlish cares to weigh, large natures down and steal the heart of understanding. Son, how is't ye feel? What are ye staring on, a gal? A ray flashed even from the fading afterglow. He dropped his hoe. He dropped his hoe, but sudden stooped again and raised it where it fell. Nothing, he spoke, but bent his knee and, crack, the handle broke, splintering. With glare of pain, he flung the pieces down and stamped upon them. Then, like one who leaps out naked from his cloak, ran. Here, come back, where are you bound, you fool? He cried, to school. Two. Now on the mountain, morning laughed with light, with light and all the future in her face, for there she looked on many a far-off place and wild, adventurous sight for which the mad young autumn wind hallowed with might and dared the roaring millbrook to the race, where blue jay screamed beyond the pine-dark pool, to school, to school. Black-coated, Eben took the barefoot trail, holding with wary hand his Sunday boots. Harsh catbirds mocked his whistling with their hoots under his swallow-tail, against his hip-strap bumping clinked his dinner-pail, Frost maples flamed, lone thrushes touched their lutes, grey squirrels bobbed, with tails stiff curved to backs, to eye his tracks. Soon at the lonely crossroads he passed by, the little one-room schoolhouse, he peered in. There stood the bench where he had often been, admonished flagrantly, to drone his numbers, now to this he said good-bye, for mightier lure of more romantic scene, goodbye to childish rule and homely chore for evermore. All day he hastened like the flying cloud, breathless above him, big with dreams, yet dumb. With tightened jaw he chewed the tart spruce gum and muttered half aloud, huge oracles. At last, where through the pine tops bowed, the sun it rose. His heart beat like a drum, and there it rose his tower of prophecy, the academy. 3. They learn to live who learn to contemplate, for contemplation is the unconfined God who creates us to the growing mind. Freedom to think is fate and all that age and after-knowledge augurate lies in a little dream of youth enshrined, that dream to nourish with the skilful rule of love is school. 
Eben, in mystic tumult of his teens, stood bursting like a ripe seed into soul. All his long life he had watched the great hills roll, their shadows, tints, and sheens. By sun and moonrise, yet the bane of hoeing beans, and the round of joyless chores, his father's toll, blotted their beauty, nature was as naught, he had never thought. But now he climbed his boyhood's castle tower, and knocked, ah, well then, for his after-fate, that one of nature's masters opened the gate, where, like an April shower, live influence quickened all his earth-blind seed to power. Strangely, his sense of truth grew passionate, and like a young bull, led in yoke to drink, he bowed to think. There also bowed their heads with him to quaff the snorting herd, and many a wholesome grip he had of rivalry and fellowship. Often the game was rough, but Eben tossed his horns and never balked the cuff, for still through play and task his dream would slip, a radiant herdsman guiding destiny to his degree. 4. Once more old Hezekiah stayed his hoe to squint at Eben, silent. Eben scanned a little roll of sheepskin in his hand, while, row on dusky row, Tall bean poles ribbed with dark, the gold pale afterglow. The boy looked up. Here was another land, mountain and farm with mystic beauty flared, where Eben stared. Stooping, he lifted with a furtive smile two splintered sticks and spliced them. Nevermore his spirit would go beastwise to his chore, Blinded for even while, he stooped to the old task. Sudden in the sunset's pile, his radiant herdsman swung a fiery door, through which came forth with far-born trumpetings, poets and kings. His fellow conquerors, there Virgil dreamed, there Caesar fought and won the barbarous tribes, there Darwin, pensive, bore the ignorant jibes, and one with thorns redeemed. From malice the wild hearts of men there surged and streamed with chemic fire the forges of old scribes, testing anew the crucibles of toil to save God's soil. So Eben turned again to hoe his beans, but now to ballads which his herdsmen sang. Henceforth he hoed the dream in which the dung and for his ancient spleens planting new joys, imagination found him means. At last Hezekiah loosed his tongue. Well, boy, this skull, what has it learned ye to know? He said, to hoe. The Forum, Percy Mackay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Marvellous Munchausen by William Rose Bennett Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone The snug little room with its brazier fire aglow And peat and sacks and vroom All in the long ago Oh, the very long ago Or their pipes and hollands seen And on the wall the man o' war And firelight on the screen their flowered bulging waistcoats that wrinkle when they chuckle, the baron much mustachioed and gay with star and buckle, and bristling in a uniform as scarlet as his cheeks, with choker lace beneath his chin, and splendid yellow breeks. The smoke drifts blue and bluer through the window all a breeze, a glinting sky and glistening sea beyond the holland keys. Blue tiles, red bricks, the bustling wharves with colours oriflam, starch caps and rosy posy cheeks, the girls of Amsterdam. The snug little room with its brazier fire aglow, oh, listen, will he tell them as he told them long ago? Oh, very long ago, a laughing in his sleeve, the marvellous Munchausen with the fables I believe. When I had sown the turkey beans that reached to the moon, and lifted all Westminster in the sling from my balloon, 
swung over the atlantic they peered from windows frantic when eagle back i scanned the pole in broad eternal noon in queen mab's chariot i ventured on the sea twas like a mammoth hazelnut with matchless orrery a sparkle on its ceiling with planet systems wheeling and giddy comets sizzling all about the head o' me the nine bulls drew it as stout as those of crete and all were shod with horrid skulls that clattered on their feet rich banners waved behind them while on their backs to mind them postilion crickets chirrup them all chirping loud and sweet ghost of the cape i warn you of for he is bottle blue we split his table mountain he gibbered and he flew the bulls straight showed this feature with gazing on the creature stampeding in their harness when i gave the view halloo though wrecked on egypt's obelisks disaster i defied and harness sphinx the emperor's gift to tow an ark as wide as great westminster with bow and bell and spinster and cleric clerk and coronet all tete-a-tete inside good folks we sail for africa i said to all my train when bold munchausen leads you forth what laggard dare remain in slippered ease uncaring to share my deeds of daring their cheers amazed my modesty and more than made me vain the sultan's bees i've shepherded i've hornpiped at marseilles where gulped me down well nigh to drown the liveliest of whales i'm riskiest of riskers but blow my grizzled whiskers i cried may jackals gnaw my bones if now munchausen fails by night the lions roared at us by day the simoons came and swept across our caravan in sandy clouds of flame but naught dismayed our temper or the genial afric emperor had missed my handsome greeting to his long abiding shame the people of the mountains of the moon i wined and dined i reigned at gristariska when his majesty declined reforms i wrought untiring with gog and magog squiring and frosticos my bosom friend who lent a legal mind for last superb achievement bright tears may envy shed i built a bridge from africa to distant england spread no edifice of fable nay not the tower of babel surpassed its mammoth glory in the heavens overhead so back across its noble arch my retinue and i advanced with blaring trumpets through the regions of the sky clouds lingered to enwreathe us earth's kingdoms far beneath us and martial music cheered our march from all the birds that fly the snug little room with its brazier fire aglow and peat and sax and vroom all sleeping long ago oh so very long ago and chuckling in his sleeve still o'er the slumbering table drone droning on his fable the marvellous munchausen with the stories i believe century end of poem this recording is in the public domain Trainmates by Witter Biner, read for LibriVox.org by Dusidi. Outside Hove Shasta, snowy height on height, a glory but a negligible sight. For you had often seen a mountain peak, but not my paper, so we came to speak. A smoke, a smile, a good way to commence, the comfortable exchange of difference. You, a young engineer, five feet eleven, forty-five chests with football in your heaven, Liking a road bed newly built and clean, your fingers hot to cut away the green of brush and flowers that bring beside a track the kind of beauty steel lines ought to lack. And I, a poet wistful of my betters, reading George Meredith's high hearted letters, joining between while in the mingled speech of a drummer, circus man, and parson, each absorbing to himself, as I to me, and you to you, a glad identity after a while when the others went away a curious kinship made us want to stay which i could tell you now but at the time you thought of baseball teams and i of rhyme until we found that we were college men and smoked more easily and smiled again 
and i from cambridge cried the poet still i know your fine greek theatre on the hill at berkeley with your happy grecian head upraised i never saw the place you said once i was free of class i always went out to the field young engineer you meant as fair a tribute to the better part as ever i did beauty of the heart is evident in temples but it breathes alive where athletes quicken airy wreaths which are the lovelier because they die you are a poet quite as much as i though differences appear in what we do and i an athlete quite as much as you because you half surmised my quarter mile and i your quatrain we could greet and smile who knows but we shall look again and find the circus man and drummer not behind but leading in our visible estate as discus thrower and as lottery eight end of poem this recording is in the public domain the calliope yell by nicholas vachel lindsay read for librivox dot org by andrew gauntz loudly and rapidly with a leader college yell of fashion one proud men eternally go about slander me call me the calliope sizz fizz two i am the gutter dream tune maker born of steam tooting joy tooting hope i am the calliope car called the calliope willy 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 wahoo see the flag snow white tent see the bear and elephant see the monkey jump the rope listen to the calliope 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 soul of the rhinoceros and the hippopotamus listen to the lion roar jaguar cockatoot loons owls hoot hoot listen to the lion roar listen to the lion roar listen to the lion r o a r hear the leopard cry for gore willy 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 wahoo hail the bloody injun band hail all hail the popcorn stand hail to barnum's picture there people's idol everywhere whoop 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 music of the mob am i circus day's tremendous cry i am the calliope 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 hoot toot hoot toot hoot toot hoot toot willy 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 wahoo sizz fizz three born of mobs born of steam listen to my golden dream listen to my golden dream listen to my g-o-l-d-e-n-d-r-e-a-m whoop 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 i will blow the proud folk low humanize the dour and slow i will shake the proud folk down listen to the lion roar popcorn crowds shall rule the town willy 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 wahoo steam shall work melodiously brotherhood increase you'll see the world and all it holds for fifty cents apiece willy 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 wahoo every day a circus day what well almost every day never more the sweater's den never more the prison pen gone the war on land and sea that aforetime troubled men nations all in amity happy in their plumes arrayed in the long bright street parade bands a playing every day what well almost every day i am the calliope 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 willy 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 wahoo hoot toot hoot toot whoop 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 willy 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 wahoo sizz fizz four every soul resident in the earth's one circus tent every man a trapeze king then a pleased spectator there on the benches in the ring while the neighbors gawk and stare and the cheering rolls along almost every day a race when the merry starting gong rings each chariot on the line every driver fit and fine with the steel spring roman grace almost every day a dream almost every day a dream every girl maid or wife wild with music eyes agleam with that marvel called desire actress princess fit for life armed with honor like a knife jumping through the hoops of fire listen to the lion roar making all the children shout clowns shall tumble all about painted high and full of song while the cheering rolls along though they scream though they rage every beast in his cage every beast in his den that aforetime troubled men five I am the calliope, 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 tooting hope, tooting hope, tooting hope, tooting hope, shaking window pane and door with a crashing cosmic tune, with the war cry of the spheres, rhythm of the roar of noon, rhythm of Niagara's roar, voicing planet, star, and moon, shrieking of the better years 
Prophet singers will arise, prophets coming after me, sing my song in softer guise with more delicate surprise. I am but the pioneer, a voice of the democracy. I am the gutter dream, I am the golden dream, singing science, singing steam. I will blow the proud folk down, listen to the lion roar. I am the Calliope, 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 tooting hope, tooting hope, tooting hope, tooting hope, willy 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 wahoo. Hoot toot, hoot toot, hoot toot, hoot toot, whoop 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 whoop, willy 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 wahoo. Sizz. Fizz. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thanksgiving for Our Task by Seamus O'Sheel. Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. The sickle is dulled of the reaping, and the threshing floor is bare. The dust of night's in the air, the peace of the weary is ours. All day we have taken the fruit and the grain and the seeds of the flowers. The evening is chill. It is good now to gather in peace by the flames of the fire. We have done now the deed that we did for our need and desire. We have wrought our will. And now for the boon of abundance and golden increase, an immured peace, shall we thank our God? Bethink us, amid his indulgence, his terrible rod? Shall we be as the maple and oak, strew the earth with our gold, giving only bare boughs to the sky? Nay, the pine stayeth green, while the winter growls sullenly by, and doth not revoke. For soft days or stern days, the pledge of its constancy, shall we not be also the same through all days, giving thanks when the battle breaks on us, in toil giving praise? O Father, who saw at the dawn that the folly of pride would be the lush weed of our sin, there is better than that in our hearts. O enter therein, a light burneth, though wan. And weak be the flame, yet it gloweth our humility. Ah, how can it be, trimmed o'er the wick, and replenished with oil to burn brightly and golden and quick? For deep in our hearts we wish to be thankful through lean years and fat without change, knowing that here thou hast set for the spirit a range, we would play well our parts. Making America throb with the building of souls and the glory of good, yea, and we would, and before the last autumn we will, build a temple from ocean to ocean where deeds never still. Melodiously shall proclaim thanksgiving forever that thou hast set here to our hand so wondrous a mystical harvest that thou dost demand sheaves bound in thy name. Yea, supersubstantial sheaves of strong souls that have grown fain to be known as the corn of thine occident field. O yielder of all, can America worthily thank thee till such be her yield? In the mellowing light of the goldenest days that precede the grey days of the year, we sing thee our harvesting song and we pray thee to hear in the midst of thy might. Labour is given to us, let us give thanks. Power worketh through us, let us give thanks. Not for what we have, so might speak a slave, not for the garnering, gratefully we sing, but for the mighty thing we must do, travailing, for our task and for our strength, for the journey and its length, for our dauntless eagerness, for our humbling weariness, for these, for these, O Father, let us give thanks. For these, O Mighty Father, take thou our thanks. The Forum, Seamus O'Sheel. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Likeness by Willa Sibbert Cather. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. Portrait Bust of an Unknown. Capital, Rome. In every line a supple beauty, the restless head 
a little bent, disgust of pleasure, scorn of duty, the unseeing eyes of discontent. I often come to sit beside him, this youth who passed and left no trace of good or ill that did betide him, save the disdain upon his face. The hope of all his house, the brother, adored the golden-hearted son, whom fortune pampered like a mother, and then a shadow on the sun. Whether he followed Caesar's trumpet or chanced the riskier game at home, to find how favor played the strumpet in fickle politics at Rome. Whether he dreamed a dream in Asia, he never could forget by day, or gave his youth to some Aspasia, or gamed his heritage away. Once lost across the empire's border, this man would seek his peace in vain. His look arraigns a social order, somehow entrammeled with his pain. The dice of gods are always loaded. One gambler arrogant as they, fierce and by fierce injustice goaded, left both his hazard and the play. Incapable of compromises, unable to forgive or spare, the strange awarding of the prizes, he had no fortitude to bear. Tricked by the forms of things material, the solid seeming arch and stone, the noise of war, the pomp imperial, the heights and depths about a throne. He missed, among the shapes diurnal, the old, deep-traveled road from pain, the thoughts of men which are eternal, in which eternal men remain. Retrato dignoto defying, things unsubstantial as a dream, an empire long in ashes lying, his face still set against the stream. Yes, so he looked, that gifted brother, I loved, who passed and left no trace, not even luckier than this other, his sorrow in a marble face. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Field of Glory by Edwin Arlington Robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug War shook the land where Levi dwelt, And fired the dismal wrath he felt, That such a doom was ever wrought as his, To toil while others fought, To toil, to dream, and still to dream, With one day barren as another, To consummate, as it would seem, The dry despair of his old mother. Far off, one afternoon, began the sound of man destroying man. And Levi, sick with nameless rage, condemned again his heritage, and sighed for scars that might have come, and would, if once he could have sundered those harsh and hearing claims of home that held him while he cursed and wondered. Another day, and then there came, rough, bloody, ribald, hungry, lame, but yet themselves, to Levi's door, to remnants of the day before. They laughed at him, and what he sought. They jeered him, and his painful acre. But Levi knew that they had fought, and left their manners to their maker. That night, for the grim widow's ears, with hopes that hid themselves in fears, he told of arms and featly deeds, whereat one leaps the while he reads, and said he'd be no more a clown while others drew the breath of battle. The mother looked him up and down and laughed, a scant laugh with a rattle. She told him what she found to tell, and Levi listened and heard well some admonitions of a voice that left him no cause to rejoice. He sought a friend and found the stars and prayed aloud that they should aid him. But they said not a word of wars or of a reason why God made him. And whose of this or that estate we do not wholly calculate, when baffling shades that shift and cling are not without their glimmering, when even Levi, tired of faith, beloved of none, forgot by many, 
dismissed as an inferior wraith, reborn may be as great as any. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rich Man, Poor Man by Francis Hill. Read for LibriVox.org by Damien1110. Oh, joy that burns in Denver Tavern, the lights, the drink, the ceaseless play. A kingdom, dawn within the cavern, across the boards he flings away. Then night that falls on either mountain, ah, bitter black it falls between. But he, like water to his fountain, is come again where life runs clean. So death shall find him, delving, peering, still silver rock, still golden sand. He weeps to hear the magpies jeering, but he is back in his own land. And a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sin Eater by Ruth Comfort Mitchell. Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel May. Hark ye! Hush ye! Margot's dead! Hush! I've done with your brawling tune. Dance she did till the stars grew pale. Mother o' God, and she's gone at noon. Shush! Do you hear me? Margot's dead! Sickened and drooped and died in an hour. Bring me the milk and the meat and bread. Drooped she did, like a wilted flower. Come and look at her, how she lies, little and lone and like she's scared. She lost her beads last Friday week, tore her book and she never cared. Ech, my lass, but it's winter now. You that ever was meant for June, your laughing mouth and your dancing feet, and now you're done, like an ended tune. Where's that woman? Ah, give it me quick. Food at her head and her poor, still feet. There's plenty full. Do you think the wench had so many sins for himself to eat? Take up your cloak and hand me mine. Are we fetching him? Eh, for sure. And you'll come with me for all your quakes, clear to his cave across the moor. Margot, dearie, don't look so scared. It's no long while till your peace begins. What if you tore your book, poor lamb, and bringing you one will eat your sins? It's a blood-red sun that's sinking. Oh, but the marshland's drear. Woman, for why will you be shrinking? I'm telling you there's naught to fear. What if the twilight's gloomish and the shadows creep and crawl? Woman, woman, he'll be the cave. Stand by me close till I call. Sin eater, devil cheater. Eh, it echoes hollowly. Margot's dead at Willow Farm. Shroud your face and follow me. One of the clock, two of the clock. This night's a week in span. Still he crouches by her side. Devil, ghost, or man. Women, never cock's crow sounded sweet before. Set the casement wide ajar, fasten back the door. Eh, but I be cold and stiff waiting for the dawn. Fetch me flowers. Jessamine, see, the food is gone. Light enough to see her now. Mary, how her face shines on us like altar fires, now she's sure a grace. Never mind your book, my lamb, never mind your beads. There's the gleam before you now. Follow it where it leads. Tearful peace and gentle grief brood on Willow Farm. Margot, sleeping in her flowers, smiles secure from harm. In a cave across the moor, dank and dark within, moans the trafficker in souls, freshly bowed with sin. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Night Sentries by George Sterling Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Ever as sinks the day on sea or land, Called or uncalled, you take your kindred posts, At helm and lever, wheel and switch, you stand On the world's wastes and melancholy coasts, Strength to the patient hand, to all Alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. Now roars the wrenching train along the dark. How many watchers guard the barren way in signal towers at stammering keys to mark the word the whispering horizons say to all that see and hark. 
To all, alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. On ruthless streets, on byways, sad with sin, half hated by the blinded ones you guard, guard well, lest crime unheeded enter in. The dark is cruel, and the vigil hard, the hours of guilt begin. To all, alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. Now storms the pulsing hull adown the sea, gaze onward, anxious eyes, to mist or star, where foams the heaving highway, blank and free, where wait the reef, the berg, the cape, the bar. Whatever menace be, to all, alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. Now the surf rumble rides the midnight wind, and grave patrols are on ocean edge. Now soars the rocket where the billows grind, discerned too late, on sunken shoal or ledge. To all that seek and find, to all, alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. On lonely headlands gleam the lamps that warn, star steady, or a blink like dragon eyes. Govern your rays, or wake the giant horn within the fog that welds the sea and skies. Far distant runs the morn. To all, alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. Now glow the lesser lamps in rooms of pain, where nurse and doctor watch the joyless breath, drawn in a sigh, and sighing lost again. Who waits without the threshold, life or death? Reckon you loss or gain? To all, alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. Honour to you that guard our welfare now, to you that constant in the past have stood, to all by whom the future shall avow unconquerable fortitude and good. Upon the sleepless brow of each, alert and faithful in the night, may there be light. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Swordless Christ by Percy Adams Hutchinson Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Visisti Galilee I, down the years, behold, he rides, The lowly Christ upon an ass. But conquering? Ten shall heed his call, A thousand idly watch him pass. They watch him pass, or lightly hold in mock lip loyalty his name. A thousand were they his to lead, but meek without a sword he came. A myriad horsemen swept the field with Attila, the whirlwind hun. A myriad cannon spake for him, the silent dread Napoleon. For these had ready spoil to give, had reeking spoil for savage hands. Slaves and fair wives and pillage rare, the wealth of cities, teeming lands. And if the world, once drunk with blood, sated, has turned from arms to peace, man hath not lost his ancient lusts, the weapons change, war doth not cease. The mother in the stifling den, the brain dulled child beside the loom, the hordes that swarm and toil and starve, we laugh and tread them to their doom. They shriek and cry their prayers to Christ, and lift wan faces, hands that bleed. In vain they pray, for what is Christ? A leader without men to lead. Ah, piteous Christ, afar he rides. We see him, but the face is dim. We that would leap at crash of drums are slow to rise and follow him. The Forum in the poem this recording is in the public domain what of the night by willard huntington wright read for librivox dot org by larry wilson what of the night and the eventual silences art thou not cold with the knowledge of decay and the uncompromising reaches of the earth 
what of the night when the tune falters and the blood chills when thou art one with the grass and the underbrush of the world wilt thou forget the names of flowers the rhythm of song and lips still balmy with the breasts of women when thou and the fog on the hilltop are as brother and sister wilt thou forget utterly the ways of men the clash of swords and the sting of wine the dim horizons and the grace of girls when thou art alone eternally what of the night where will god be when thou art swathed in silence when the wreckage of dreams has crushed thee and the lust for springtimes dissolved thee wilt thou have visions only of the dawn and autumn sunsets will the memory of women's faces haunt thy grave will the odor of blue flowers find thy dust when thou art choking on the calm indifference of youth and the everlasting beauty of trees wilt thou dream only of the june the love of women and the great democracy of men when thou hast fought and failed and thy brow has withered laurelless and thy name has been effaced by the insatiable winds and thou hast gone out at the western gate to join the laggards of the dead wilt thou crave only the withheld success the transitory fame of twilight years will thy soul cry out only for the song the red dawn and the glad triumph of love wilt thou indeed forget the days of pain the ineffectual prayers the lies of time and the bitterness of defeat or remembering these things wilt thou forget the hands of women and the rude love of men and be glad of thy dark quietude when thou art part of the impending gloom i deem that life will seem to thee in no such wise but rather thou wilt dream it as a whole not as a song nor yet a broken bell but all that thou hast been the great tears the rain the kisses and the flutes the old sorrows and the hills at dawn much laughter and much grief and the stern fight and thou shalt know how all of life is gain the gold of youth the gray defeat of age how in the soul's inharmony there lies the incoherent unity of things the forum end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Threnody by Louis V. Ledoux. Read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens. In memory of the destruction of Messina by Earthquake. Sicilian Muse, O thou who sittest dumb amid the sodden fields and ways forlorn, where once the herdsmen singing watched their kine, breast deep in fragrance, odorous eve and morn, stranger to thee, yet led by love I come a suppliant sable stole to mix with thine my tears and at thy shrine kindle a funeral torch for sicily give not the suppliant's prayer the meed of blame scorn not the stranger's proffered oil and wine o thou from whom the heavenly madness came when orpheus hymning struck his golden lute and stirred old memories in persephone while all the lonely shades in hell stood mute to watch the still beloved Eurydice, borne lightly upward on the silver surge, to Enna's flowery verge. Spirit august, child of Nemosyne, with reverence and true humility, I break before thy feet my careless flute, and wait upon my lips thy touch of flame. Begin, Sicilian muse, begin the dirge, O race unmindful of the destinies. The dread Eumenides, or Morai old, sent from earth's inmost core, a tremor, warning blindly ye who blind, see not the sleepless doom that evermore has watched your tragic shore, since lost sea rovers shaded first their eyes to spy the riches of your waving store, and grated up your sands with doubtful keel. The startled jungle growing above its young, the arctic foxes snuffed the scentless wind, but ye who knew yourself a fated race, that gods have loved and gods to hate exposed, 
though black the death clouds over Etna hung, forgot the anguish in Pompey's face, beneath her half-drawn winding sheet disclosed, forgot white Lisbon's doom, nor called to mind in pleasant zankel taking noonday ease, how from its ashes by the western seas a stricken phoenix rises, stone and steel. Fresh as her poro flowers at early dawn, when over Hiblia's hills the yellow bees from aromatic blossoms shake the dew, fair as the maiden ere by dark fate drawn, she saw the wide earth yawn, before the thunderous horses and the strong arm of Aedes crushed her gathered flowers, so fresh, so fair, amid her storied seas, she who remains through changes e'en long, a greater Helen wooed with sword and song, of mightier victor's bride and battle prize, lay lapped in peace, when swift from Hades driven, upward the death king came, the earth was riven, and through the darkness rang her children's cries. Now Scylla unto fierce Charybdis calls, while on the water spreads a crimson stain, now Galatea sobs in ocean halls, and vengeful Polyphemus laughs again. The Nereids now in oozy caverns hide, where sea kings the old Aeolian shore watch sunken Argus's forevermore, and tell their tales of dread Poseidon's hate, while dimly from the far ensanguined tide, patient Odysseus, furrowed once of yore, a glint of daylight through the darkness falls. On swaying helmets, tumbled bronze and gold, on broidered vestments stiff and Tyrian dyed. There hide they, but the sea kings keep their state, telling of ancient dooms and deaths of old, nor know they how beside the darkened strait, and up the slopes of olive, vine and grain, the dryads wail, a land left desolate. Wail thou, great muse, the dear Sicilian land, now greater grief is thine than when of old young Adon in the Cyprian's arms lay cold, and Daphnis's years were told. Take thou the lyre from time's enfeebled hand. Hushed is the music of Empedocles, of splendid Pindar, pure Simonides, Bion and Moscus and Theocritus, and those who unto us, nameless yet live as human memories. Hushed, is the last of all that laurelled band, hushed o'er on Charon's strand, urging in vain petition dolorous, to pass where Pan, his boyish pipings done, stands wistful, while the nymphs by fear made bold cling with their long, lithe arms about his knees. Wail thou, great muse, or loose from Acheron, some worthy bearer of the singing bough, whose madness whirls me now on melting wings too near the sudden sun. Yet why for aught on earth should grief be loud, since all that is is born to pass away? Hero and maiden to the urn are vowed, and beauty saves not when the debt falls due. Apollo with the darker gods has died, and Gaia the last shall be as they. O Helen of the soul, O golden isle, by beauty doomed, by beauty sanctified, thou too canst not abide, but like all else shall last a little while, a little longer than the falling spray, then pass as planet dust or gaseous cloud to build new cosmos, gnawed by new decay. Earth's senseless atoms ever clasp and whirl, unclasp again to form in mazes new, and ever on the white cliff stands some girl with dead eyes gazing on the sailless blue. Earth's roses die, but still the rose lives on. The song survives the swift Leucadian leap. A dream of immortality is ours, where golden Daphnis in the morning shone, fresh sprung from Helicon, New shepherds singing lead their careless sheep above the graves of Athens, Carthage, Rome, vandals and Muslims and strange northern powers that filled their destined hours and fed in turn the rich Sicilian loam, building like coral insects from the deep, 
enchanted islands that, till earth is gone, swept back to chaos in the atom's swirl, shall be the seeker's light, the spirit's home. Though Etna crumble and the dark seas rise, sowing the uplands with their sterile brine, still shall the soul decry with wistful eyes Sicilian headlands bright with flower and fruit. Still shall she hear, though all earth's lips be mute, Sicilian music in the morning skies. Yea, deep within the heart of man it lies, this visioned island bright with old romance, a race inheritance of rest and joy and faith in things divine that shall endure a while through change and chance and have the meaning of a childhood shrine remembered when the faith of childhood dies. Now fails the song and down the lonely ways the last low echoes die upon the breeze I lay my lyre upon the moveless knees of her who by the hollow roadway stays, in anguish waiting for her children slain that shall not come again, with springtime leading the new lambs to graze. They come no more, but while o'er hill and plain the twilight darkens and the evening rose aloft on Etna glows, Silent she sits amid the sodden leaves, with eyes that level on the ocean haze, their unobserving stare as seaward gaze the eyes of stolid Cariatides. Scribner's Louis V. Ledoux. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. November by Malin Leonard Fisher, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gauntz. Hark you such sound as quivers? Kings will hear as kings have heard, and tremble on their thrones. The old will feel the weight of mossy stones. The young alone will laugh and scoff at fear. It is the tread of armies marching near, from scarlet lands to lands forever pale. It is a bugle dying down the gale. It is the sudden gushing of a tear. And it is hands that grope at ghostly doors, and a romp of spirit children on the pave. It is the tender sighing of the brave who fell, ah, uh, long ago in futile wars. It is such sound as death. And, after all, tis but the forest letting dead leaves fall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Salutation by Ruth Sterry Read for LibriVox.org Did you choose the journey, friend? No, nor I. But to make it cheerfully, let us try. When the day is dark, I pray. Sing a song to cheer the way, For tomorrow we will be One day nearer to the sea. Did you choose the journey, friend? No, nor I, But we know the end will come By and by. All today we bear the load Up the weary winding road, but tomorrow we may be at the inn in company. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Here Lies Pierrot by Richard Burton. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The moon's a shine, by many a lane walk wistful lovers to and fro. It must be like old days again. How do they love? Here lies Pierrot. She loved me once, did Columbine. It sets my dusty heart aglow, merely to lie and dream how fine her semblance was. Here lies Pierrot. Her perfumed presence, silks and lace, 
did madden men and wrought them woe for me alone her wishing grace where is she now here lies pierrot we two walked once beneath the moon yellow it hung and large and low and listened to the tender tune of nightingales here lies pierrot our foolish vows of passion shook the very stars they trembled so how it comes back her soft shy look now i am dead here lies pierrot these other men and maids who stroll through moonlit poplar trees a row does each play the enchanted role we phantoms played here lies pierrot o oh, joy that i remember yet sweet follies of the long ago dear heaven i would not quite forget the moon's a shine here lies pierrot scribner's end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of anthology of magazine verse for 1913 edited by william stanley braithwaite